Once again, welcome and thank you so much for joining us this evening. I am very much looking forward to tonight's talk because we are going to see a comparison of the wildlife and the landscapes of Midcoast Maine and Utah. Um, we have our very special guest, Brian Wilson, joining us all the way this evening from Utah. Um, but before we introduce him, I am going to turn the program over to Polly Jones, who is our representative from the Coastal Mountains Land Trust. This program tonight is part of our Coastal Mountains Land Trust series that we do every month on second Thursdays. So Polly, your turn, take it away. Thank you, Julia. Thanks everybody for coming. We are so happy to partner with Camden Public Library on these talks. And Julia is the Zen master of the Zoom platform. Everything goes smoothly with her, um, her work. Um, as she mentioned, uh, this Coastal Mountains Land Trust, we're a membership organization. We've been working to conserve land since 1986. We've uh, conserved over 12,000 acres from Rockport to Prospect and offer over 50 miles of trails. Um, if you're already a member, thank you for being one. If you'd like to join, please go to our website, coastalmountains.org. I'm so pleased to introduce Brian Wilson. Brian was a founding board member of Coastal Mountains way back in 1986 and a volunteer ever since until he moved to Salt Lake City in 2019. Um, a nature loving birder who cannot seem to stop hiking, Brian and his dog, Captain Jack, hiked the trails of Beach Hill Preserve every single day for seven years. We're delighted to see you again, Brian, and thank you for doing this. Over to you. Thanks, Polly. Thanks, Julia. Um, we didn't do it every single day. There were a few days, maybe 360 days a year, but <laughs> we got very used to <laughs> Beach Hill, that's for sure. Um, Yes, just a little background. Uh, I, Captain Jack came into my life at age two in 2010. And that's about the time that I started this sort of obsessive hiking every day. And being a volunteer trail steward at uh, Beach Hill, that was the perfect spot. It was maybe 10 minutes from home. So that's where we, we went. And um, for, as Polly mentioned, she's six or seven years. And it was just me and Jack there. I've been lucky enough to be able to work from home and, and, and kind of make my own hours. Uh, I was traveling light. My daughter lives in California. Uh, my own, basically my other family lived in other states. So I thought I, in 2018, I went to visit a friend, old friend here in Salt Lake City, and I liked it. It was in the fall. And I thought, why not? I'll just uh, on a lark you know, shake up my life a little bit. I was traveling light. I put all my stuff in a U-Haul trailer and Jack and I drove across the country. I rented a place first, of course. Drove across, it was a nice place, across the country and moved into this uh, duplex that is in the foothills of the Wasatch Range. So it's, that's on the eastern side of the Salt Lake City Basin. I'm, I actually have a deck where I can look out and see Salt Lake City toward the Northwest. So it's a cool house. Uh, but all we have to do is walk up the street and there's a trailhead that goes up into the mountains. Uh, basically deer trails, although uh, most of the, you know, the easy to access trails have been walked so many times by humans that it's not that difficult. However, it's a lot steeper than Beach Hill. <laughs> so uh, we're right around a mile high here and uh, a little, little bit less than Denver. But uh, after about two months of hiking pretty much every day, I'd lost 20 pounds, didn't even want to. <laughs> uh, so anyway, since October of 2019, and this is for real, I don't know exactly the date, mid-October 2019, we've hiked up here every day, including this morning. Uh, and my, my passion is nature. My hobby is bird wild bird photography. I've been a birder since I moved to Maine. And maybe a lot of you know this stuff, but um, uh, I would take pictures of birds every day on my hikes in Maine, and I do the same thing here. And it was really interesting for me to see the difference in the species on either side of the Rockies. 
and also the landscapes, the mammals and the insects and all kinds of stuff like that. So what I've done is put together mostly, there's not a lot of landscape shots here. This is mostly nature. I'm comparing and contrasting the main nature that I knew so well with this Utah, the birds and mammals and so forth of Utah that uh, I'm, I've been learning the past couple of years. So that said, see if I can launch my little slideshow here, share my screen. And as you can see, my desktop pattern remains Beach Hill looking off into Penobscot Bay. But my little slideshow starts with an Eastern towhee. Now this is a very common bird on Beach Hill, at Beach Hill, that uh, I'd encounter pretty much every day during the high season. And um, love this little guy, drink your tea. So out here, there's what you call a spotted towhee in Utah. And it's also very common where we hike. Uh, interesting thing about these birds is that they were once considered one species. They were the rufous sided towhee, but I don't know how many years ago they were split into two. The songs are similar, but, but different. The difference in the look of these birds is that this spotted towhee has the spots on his back. So that's one comparison. Of course, in Maine, there's the uh, common American goldfinch. And out here, there's the lesser goldfinch, which has sort of a black head. That's the male anyway. Actually, the females look similar. And there are actually American goldfinches here, but there are no lesser goldfinches in Maine. In the mammal department, Maine has the white-tailed deer, of course. This is a photo from Beach Hill somewhere, I believe. <laughs> and out here, there's the mule deer. And you can see, like, what big ears you have. That's where the mule deer got its name. Uh, they're all over the place where we hike. I see many more mule deer. I, I have probably seen more mule deer in my life now than I've ever seen white-tailed deer. And you can actually get pretty close to them. One interesting thing about them is they, they live in the scrub oaks. And scrub oaks are little short, stubby sort of oak trees that are uh, rugged, pointy. You know, you, you can scrape and scratch. So if they ever get spooked, very often these deer will actually hop. They, 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 they can, of course, run as well, but through the scrub, they hop on all fours. It's just amazing. I think I laughed the first time I saw it. Okay, in Maine, of course, there's the Eastern Bluebird. This is a picture on one of the bird boxes at Beach Hill. Beautiful little things, little thrushes. Out here, there's mountain bluebirds. And when I first saw these, this is up at about 7,500 feet, I think. Um, that, it just kind of blew me away. That was just, the, that male was so blue. But I still have a soft spot in my heart for the Eastern Bluebird as well. Okay, back there, you've got the pretty common rose-breasted grosbeak, the cutthroat bird. And out here, there's the black-headed grosbeak which I saw, I, no, I heard this morning, I didn't see it. And in the insect world, the familiar tiger swallowtail from back in Maine. They don't got them here, they have anise swallowtails, which are a lot, lot darker and a little different. This particular butterfly, by the way, the only reason I got this good of a shot, I'm not a professional photographer really, just a hobbyist, but it was uh, sunning itself and in the early morning on the on these rocks and just perfectly motionless right where we happen to be walking. Blue jay back in Maine, common bird. Out here there's one called Woodhouse's scrub jays and the scrub jays are just everywhere, a noisy bird, you know, as most jays are. But this is interesting. I only discovered this this spring. It's a courtship behavior between a pair of these birds. I've seen it twice now. It seems like, I think it's the male on the left. I first saw the female on the right perched there, I was gonna take her picture. And suddenly the male fluttered up and he, he, you can't see it here, but he had a little piece of like nesting twine or something in his beak. And the female leaned over and, and it's like they're kissing. <laughs> she got this little piece of, hay or whatever it was out of his beak and then he flew away. And there's another jay. This is a bonus jay, Stellar's jay, which they have up here. 
really cool looking bird. Also very noisy, but they're not as common. They live much higher than I usually hike. And the interesting thing about this bird is that people think that stellar's stellar has to do with you know how how stellar looking it is. That's a different spelling. It was actually named after somebody named Stellar. Ruffed grouse. This was actually in I believe in the parking lot of uh, the uh, Beach Hill Road parking lot at Beach Hill Preserve. It was a male that was hanging around one one year. Out here, there's a dusky grouse. This happens to be, this is a hen, and this happens to be one of only two I've seen, and they were both together. <laughs> and at first, I misidentified it and was corrected by the local eBird guy. It's a dusky grouse. <laughs> Bonus grouse, this is a chucker. Uh, this was an introduced bird. I think it's from Eurasia or something. And they're, they've, they're all over the place, really. And they're, they get their name, I'm pretty sure, by their voice. You can hear them way up on the ridges going chucka 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 chucka. Trout lily, beautiful little main flower. I love when they burst forth in the early spring. And um, similar here is one called a glacier lily. I do rather like the trout lily's leaves better though. <laughs> That's from this year. Scarlet tanager from back in Maine. A dramatic looking bird. Out here they have a western tanager, which a uh, little red in the face and yellow. Similar call, very similar sort of um, horse robin kind of call. Bald eagle flying over Beach Hill. Out here, it, I had never seen a golden eagle in Maine. I mean, they fly by sometimes, they live there somewhere, but I never saw one. And he, Golden eagles are all over this place. Uh, I've seen two or three dozen of them, I bet. They do, I should say, have bald eagles here as well. But where, where I hike, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a patch birder. People call me a, a person of place where I'll find a particular place that I hike every day and I get to know the birds really well. And um, where the bald eagles hang out here is down by Oh, Great Salt Lake and Lope Island, places like that, where the water is. Where I hike here, there's really not a lot of water. Um, this is a bonus Golden Eagle picture. This was on a winter day when there was a lot of fog overhead and it was soaring low over the trail where we were hiking and, where it, and it fluttered over to this little bluff that is right above a, a old lime quarry where a bunch of mountain cottontails live. And a um, friend I made who lives right below here says he'd seen golden eagles with those little bunnies in their talons before. Speaking of bunnies, this is a main snowshoe hare. That's the Beach Hill Trail right there. And there's the mountain cottontail, a little cutie. This is in that quarry I just mentioned. I'd see these, gosh, I've seen way more, many, many more uh, cottontails than I ever saw snowshoe hares They're all over the place. Uh, northern flicker, this is a yellow shafted race of northern flicker, a male, and this is from Beach Hill. Out here, they also have northern flicker, same species, but a different race. It's the red shafted northern flicker. And this was uh, fall, as you can see. Uh, this is also a male. It, and you can also see that the black mustache with this guy, red mustache with this guy, and yet that's the same species. Blue-headed vireo, an early migrant uh, in Beach Hill and the wooded, along the wooded trail especially. Uh, hard to take pictures of. They tend to flit around really high in the trees. Well, just this morning, this, is, this picture is from this morning's hike. It's a Cassin's vireo. I've only seen two of these. Saw one last spring, last May, and this one this morning. It's, these two birds used to be, uh, along with a another species I forget at the moment, used to be cons all considered one species and that's the solitary vireo, but they realized that maybe they should have been separated. But you can see they're similar looking. Coyote, this uh, Eastern coyote is, I took this picture, I think from the summit of Beach Hill and it was way in the sort of Northeastern field. And it's, these guys are uh, part wolf. They migrated 
to Maine from Canada where they uh, mated occasionally with Eastern wolves. And so they've got quite a little, you know, they got some wolf genes in them and they're larger than the mountain coyote. This I think is a female uh, that I've seen more than once. And they're not quite as big as the Eastern coyote, but they let you get closer. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this was this was this coyote was also right above that little quarry where the bunny rabbits are. Black-throated green warbler, one of my favorite Maine Eastern you know, warblers. It's a really cool looking bird. Out here, there's the black-throated gray warbler. Little yellow spot in front of its eye, and they both have kind of buzzy songs. Famous black cap chickadee, main state bird. They have black cap chickadees here as well, uh, but the accent is different. There, there, there are a couple of birds out here who have a different accent, which is really interesting to me. The uh, chickadee has, it's got the same chickadee dee dee sound and it's got the same spring song, but the little note that they give and I don't know, having discussions with each other, kind of a twilly, twilly, that little note sounds totally different out here. It's much sort of louder and more musical, less subtle than the Eastern ones. By the way, Monhegan Island chickadees also have a different middle note, different from the other two, just a little bit. So accents and the other bird is a song sparrow. Song sparrows here have a really high whistly note in their song, which I've never heard in the Eastern uh, song sparrow. So that's one of the chickadees here. There's another one, the mountain chickadee. It's a cool looking bird. Kind of looks angry. And they have a very different call. Instead of chickadee, dee, dee, they say chickadee, dee, dee, <laughs> something like that. It was amusing to me the first time I heard it. Uh, inbound, this is taken from the summit of Beach Hill. I would I need to take a lot of photos of the inbound ferries as they, as they pass um, Owlshead Light. And uh, there's something kind of equivalent out here, and that is inbound airliner. <laughs> this, this is looking west across the basin at the Ochres, a, a range of mountains. The mountains are still snow capped out here. And they, anyway, the uh, airport is to the right, and this land is, this uh, airliner is about to land. Yeah, I'd like to talk a little about uh, corvids, which are crows and ravens and jays. And, um, ravens here, just like there are ravens in Maine. I mean, they're, I mean, they're about as common in this patch as they are at Beach Hill, although there is a nest right near Beach Hill. Crows out here are far less common. I, I so miss crows. <laughs> and uh, in fact, whenever I hear one calling out here, it just takes my breath away. And coincidentally, this morning on our hike, I heard a crow and sure enough, there was one way up on one of the ridges. I bet I've only seen crows up there six times. However, in the city, sometimes you can hear them calling at the grocery stores on, you know, perched on the lamps above the parking lots. Crazy. This is the common corvid out here, black-billed magpie. They kind of take the place of crows and uh, they're just everywhere. Um, people aren't real fans of black-billed magpies because of their, you know, aggressive nature. And but I think they're kind of pretty. Uh, as you might imagine from my daily hike routine, I'm kind of a man of routine and a little bit obsessive, perhaps. At Beach Hill, I love to. Uh, I, when I found out that you could eat fireweed that it was edible and the little blossoms you can just pop them in your mouth and they're kind of bittersweet tasting anytime the fireweed was blooming I would go over to a plant ask if I could pluck pluck a bloom pluck it say thank you and pop it in my mouth <laughs> and uh, out here I do the same with big sagebrush except I don't eat it I just smell it <laughs> but it just smells so good to me and then these sagebrush bushes are all over the place. 
Okay, this is a little different section. I'm gonna go uh, the other way around now. I'm gonna go from Utah to Maine and just a few of my favorite birds. This is arguably my favorite Utah bird so far. It's called the Townsend Solitaire and it is a, a thrush. It, uh, I, I'll never forget the first time I saw one. I at first thought it was a robin, but you can see its bill is really small. It's got that eye ring. It's mostly just gray but you can see a little tan around its wings there. And when it flies, it has stripes under its wings. But one of the coolest things about this plain little bird is its voice. It has, as most thrushes do, it has a beautiful song, which I've only heard a couple of times when we hiked way up the mountain. Uh, by the way, Jack and I did make it to 8,300 feet one time last year, the summit of Grandeur Peak. And these guys were all over the place up there singing. But they have a territorial song that is interesting too. It's essentially a, uh, a series of notes, just single, clear, clean, one pitch notes that repeat every about two seconds. And the note is something like, and you wait a couple seconds and there's another, and then another couple seconds and there's another, and it'll go on for a minute. So you can, and they're, they carry, the sound carries. So, Anytime I would hear this bird, that those notes, I knew that I was going to go try to get a picture of it. Very cool little bird. It'll, it'll also perch up high where you can see it. And um, they, you can get kind of close to these too, if you just walk softly. So that's one of my favorite birds here. An equivalent at Beach Hill might be the Savannah Sparrow. I just love those little birds. I love their voice. Uh, it's a sort of high insect-like song um, with a little hiccup at the end really love them. Here, the only owl I have seen in Utah is a northern pygmy owl. And the only reason I saw it, they're teeny. They're, I would say they're even smaller than a saw wet owl. But the only reason I saw this is that we were coming up, there's a little valley that um, the locals I've noticed have called, been calling Coyote Canyon. And I've only seen one coyote there, but um, it's shady. It's a uh, an uphill climb. We, we do it pretty much every day now, uh, up up this the gully, some people call it, and uh, up to a deer trail. And then we return by way of the deer trail down to where we started. But one day I was coming up and all these, uh, I guess it was fall, and juncos, dark-eyed juncos, which they have here and there, were hollering at, you know, they were all upset. And I thought they were hollering at us, me and Jack. But then I saw something flutter in a, in a juniper tree, which this is in right now, and uh, realized it looked like a little hawk at first. And I thought, oh, they're hollering at this guy. And then it popped up in on this limb and I got a picture of it. I had no idea what it was. I figured it was an owl. And it turned out to be a northern pygmy owl. And the local eBird guy, when I posted this photo, asked where, he, where I'd seen it. And when I told him, he said it was the the lowest elevation in the county that this bird has ever been seen. But that's the only owl I've seen. Some friends down by the neighborhood, right, you know, right at the edge of the trail, have a, um, I think they put, put a kestrel box up in their backyard and some screech owls nest there. But I've only seen this one. In Maine, that's my favorite owl. <laughs> that's, this is a photo from Beach Hill, one of the times when the owls were visiting. This is a male snowy owl. Here, pretty fancy bird is a lazuli bunting. Uh, this is from this year. This was a couple weeks ago when they, uh, it's about May 3rd maybe. So 10 days ago when they arrived, which was later than last year for some reason. But you can't miss them. And another little story, a little aside, when I first moved here, I moved here in the beginning of August and you know moving in getting set um, we didn't hike till maybe late August something like that and it um, gets really hot here in the summer um, but it's dry and uh, we hiked up this one of these trails actually the one that um, leads up to a place that I'll show you later but um, I saw something in the in the scrub oak and uh, 
it was a, this bird, a male feeding a, a fledgling, a young one. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've seen a really rare bird. Uh, I just was you know, really excited about it. I mean, I suppose it was exciting anyway, but it turns out these things are everywhere out here. I counted, uh, I counted 12 today on our you know, hour and a half, two hour hike. That's a favorite bird from here. And this is sort of an equivalent favorite bird from Maine. I just love black-throated blue wilder. I love its song. I love the way it looks. This is a photo from Beach Hill. I think this is a different section coming up. Well, here's Jack. I thought I'd get him in. Uh, this is my significant other, Captain Jack. And um, he's actually licking his paw back behind me as I sit here. And uh, he was two and I got him and res rescued him from, by the way, Lucky Puck Rescue. And uh, out of Kennebunk, I think, somewhere. He was two years old, now he's 13. And this was taken uh, or so ago when we hiked up to the Cairns. This is about 62, 6,400 feet. So about 1,200, about 1,200 feet higher than when, than when we start. The mountain in, in the distance to the left is called Mount Olympus. The range to the right across the basin is the Ochres, as I mentioned before. There's a very big copper mine uh, out there. And the basin, it's, they call it the Wasatch Front, the populated area from Salt, Salt Lake City's to the right. This is looking south, kind of. So that's Jack in, in uh, Utah, and here's Jack back in Maine. This was 2017 and that's beech nut. He could just jump up on those windowsills, no problem. I don't think he could do it anymore. <laughs> His, he can't hear it too well anymore and he, he could still see okay. He can catch things, uh, but his back legs are a little atrophied. He can't jump quite as high, but he's still up for a good long hike just about every day. Okay, and now I've got a couple of videos. Uh, let's see. I never can remember. Okay, I think I. All right. The spotted towhee is, as I mentioned before, really similar to the eastern towhee, but the song is quite different. The eastern towhee is a typical drink, your tea with the trill at the end. This one I got a recording of sounds pretty similar to an eastern towhee, but there's a little bit of a difference. Does have the trill at the end. But they changed their songs to the middle. Toys are pretty consistent, although they will sometimes tell you. you know, so. But it, they've got the backs are quite different. Also, the females look a little different. The females, Eastern Toys are beautiful brown, kind of a rich brown. The female spotted Toys are almost as dark as a male, just a little bit lighter colored around the head. Okay, this next video is uh, the sexy part of the presentation. This is where the female Razzly Bunting, oh, here comes the male. Oh. <laughs> now she's just gonna go about her business. Just a little preeny. <laughs> you can hear it totally in the distance. Let's see. I believe um, I have not seen. I, I didn't. I haven't seen many coyotes here. Um, but 
see, I want to get the right video. But uh, um, six weeks or so ago, I saw more than, I've only seen one per day until uh, a few weeks ago. It's not right, it's this must be it. And um, I saw what looked like a, a pregnant female way up on the side of a mountain in the shade, got her picture, and then walking back, hiking back down toward the trailhead, we were right around that little, there's a little quarry there um, where that eagle shot was taken and the bunnies live. Uh, and I was try actually trying to get a, oh, on the way, I saw three coyotes kind of heading in our direction, but you know, a little bit different direction. And I thought, well, maybe this is their annual convention or something. I'm, it was remarkable since I'd only seen, you know, maybe two or three before that. But at the time, I, you know, a little bit later, I was trying to get a photo of a, one of those little cottontails. And um, just all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this happened. Oh, that's the wrong video. Here it is. about 10 in the morning. This is broad daylight. <laughs> Surprised the heck out of me. Jack had already started down a little trail and uh, and I don't think he even heard it. His, like I say, his hearing's not great. But um, I was, turned around to look and the cottontail was scampering on the other side of the quarry from where I was trying to get his picture. This is an elk eating snow or drinking snow. I'm not sure what you want to call it. In, uh, in the wintertime, the elk will frequently come down from great heights in herds to just above where we, uh, where that cairn was, where Jack, Jack's photo, just above there, and even really close to, to the neighborhood in uh, herds to get, to get food. Uh, there were herds and herds of them last winter. This past winter, there were none. So whether it was the drought or I don't know, there has been quite a drought here. Um, but yeah, this female elk is, I mean, we weren't that far away. In fact, I think I zoom out so you can see a little better. But she just, I guess they didn't. Uh, okay, and then this one, I believe this is, Let me just start it to see. Yeah, this is, uh, I was up there's up at the top of, of Coyote Canyon when um, I heard a whistle, a strange whistling sound. And, and I didn't know that it was kind of a like that. And I thought it, it almost didn't sound like a bird, but I had to kind of check it out. So I, you know, Jack and I wandered up toward, you know, up the side of the, you know, slope there and didn't, never saw anything and thought, yeah, I do elk, I mean, you know, there wouldn't any, be any elk, but do mule deer whistle? I just didn't know. It didn't sound like a word. So we continued up and around to this ridge that we hike sometimes. And I heard it again, and I looked across the ridge, and I saw this cat. As I looked through my, you know, zoom lens of my camera, and I said aloud, is that a bobcat? And then you can hear what I say after I start this video. I think you can hear it. When the cat walked toward us and then turned to the right, I'll say something, I think. Nope. Not a bobcat. <laughs> nope, not a bobcat. Mountain lion. And you can't tell, I'll kind of go back to show you, but right about here, it opens its mouth can't really hear that whistle, but it, it's, it's so far away. We're across this, this valley, the uh, Coyote Canyon from it. I'll zoom out here in a minute to show you how far away we are, but it was a sec, it was a second, it took a second for the sound, the whistle to reach my ears, but I never knew the mountain lions whistled. 
And of course, when I got home, I had to look it up. And apparently the youngster, this one is probably a yearling. This is one of the only landscape photos you'll get, but that's, in fact, I'll go back just to show you, pause it. But um, this is uh, the kind of landscape up, up that we hike. Uh, there's also little canyons with more trees. And the farther up you get, we'll hike up above this ridge a few times where you get to the conifers. Uh, but I was really happy because, you know, I knew there were mountain lions around here. Sometimes I go down in the neighborhood and uh, I was really happy that we were so far away, probably a thousand feet or something like that. And I've talked to a lot of the locals uh, who've been, who've lived here 30 years and have never seen one. On the other hand, our friends with the, with the uh, screech owls in their box behind their house have a little trail cam and and they had one there uh, six weeks ago, just out basically in their backyard. Speaking of, uh, 10 days after this, I was way down in my house by the, <clears throat> right by almost this little highway almost. And uh, I woke up at 10 to six in the morning to the sound of a, like that, out my window in the backyard. <laughs> And I said, I lay there frozen in bed. I'm kicking myself that I didn't run and open the window to check. But later that day, somebody had a mountain lion walking by. <laughs> so yeah, they come down to the neighborhood sometimes. Uh, that might be all the videos and such. Uh, so if people is wanted to ask. Question yeah, thing? yeah, this is a great time. So if you guys have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box right now. Um, and I will read them aloud to Brian. Brian, oh my goodness, that was so good. And <laughs> it makes me want to get a way better camera than what I have. I love your zoom out from the uh, from the mountain lion. That was fantastic. Um, so I, I don't want to brag, but when you were uh, reminiscing about your love for crows. I just happened to look out the window and saw three of them. So if you ever need some photos to fill your heart, I'm happy to send you some. Well, um, if you feel they would always come in, in fall. There was a certain time in October, I think, where they would hold their conventions, basically. Yeah. Hundreds of them. And here, I think the most I've seen it once was 12, and that was one of those, oh my gosh, moments. You know, I, can't I can't even imagine that. I miss crows. They're just such a common sight around here. Yeah, I'm going to stop is. taking them for granted. Um, <laughs> so I have a question while we wait to see if anyone else jumps in. Uh, what haven't you seen yet that you are really itching to see? What have I seen yet out here? Yes. Uh, maybe an acorn woodpecker. Um, uh, I'm not sure. See, I don't really even know what there is to see yet. <laughs> so, uh, do you, so do you look them up as you find them? Yes. Okay. I, um, in fact, uh, a couple of days ago, uh, I led a little birding party of two or three uh, for the first time, really, since I've been here. Somebody wanted to go, and uh, uh, I saw a flycatcher. I mean, it wasn't anyone that I knew. And I thought it might have been a lifer for me. I'd never seen one before. And it was, it was moving its tail down and then up, you know, down and then up. And I got some pictures of it. It posed for me. And I got home and looked it up. And I'll be darned if I hadn't seen one last May. And it was a gray flycatcher. I've only seen two in my life. <laughs> one was a year ago and one was a couple of days ago. Actually, yesterday. Very cool, very cool. Well, I hope that you are constantly surprised, but with new discoveries. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question that came in. Um, someone wants to know, are there any deer ticks up there or there, or is Lyme disease a problem out there? That's a really good question. I was wondering the same, uh, especially because of Jack and my first trip to the vet, they said, oh yeah, we've got, we've got black-legged ticks, we've got deer ticks here. And there's other ticks too, I guess. Uh, that carries Rocky Mountain spotted fever, maybe, I don't know. So I thought, well, I'll continue to give him his, you know, tick medication. And I've lived here now going on two years. I've never seen a single tick. Mm. I've been hiking every day with Jack. Neither one of us had a single tick on us. I have, however, seen some snakes. They do have rattlesnakes here too. But oh, that's right. Since I grew up in Texas, I'm not that scared for me. I'm more scared for Jack, but, uh, so that's, I guess that, yeah, I mean, they supposedly do, and it's not unheard of. I just have never seen one. 
It's just not as prevalent, I guess, as it is out here. Every day at, uh, in fact, February, I've had deer ticks at Beach Hill. Really? Yeah. Um, so uh, speaking of things to be scared of, um, can, do you have any stories about one? I mean, if you're hiking 360 out of 365 days, are you out there sometimes in some pretty scary weather? And were you ever in a situation where you're like, maybe this wasn't such a good idea to go out today? There are certain days that, uh, you know, I don't feel like it, but I just make myself do it anyway. Uh, Jack is okay with it. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's been a few times when he maybe didn't wish he was out there with me. It's interesting that the, the there aren't really any, there's no north, nor'easters here. You know, mm. there's no really wind blown snow events here. So there's a lot of snow, a whole lot of snow, but it just kind of falls down. There are windy days too, but they're not, they don't tend to be the snowy days. Um, there was one particular day where it was a little windy and kind of wet, kind of rainy and snowy, which was just wet as can be. And the mud, the, uh, you know, but the mud season here is like a week. You know, oh, just, lucky you. <laughs> it's so dry, everything dries up. Uh, I would say, yeah, some of the wet days or the muddy days, but mm, nothing really like some of the times we've been on Beach Hill. I mean, oh. <laughs> there were some blizzards when we were at Beach Hill that neither one of us really wanted to be there. <laughs> Not oh. really scary, just kind of uncomfortable. Um, Polly has a couple questions. She wants to know, um, do they have brown tail moth out there yet? Because that's also such a problem here right now. I don't believe so. I've never heard of them, but I have heard of, of course, in fact, I, I've never really heard of them before we moved. Hmm. Uh, but I've definitely heard of them in the last couple of years back in Maine, just not here. Speaking of, of moving, so someone also wanted to, I know you touched on it a little bit at the beginning of the program. Um, they wanted to know what made you decide Utah for relocation? Uh, just because I have a friend here and uh, I got to spend a, like a few days here and see what it was like. And it's near, my daughter's in LA, my sister is in Austin. <clears throat> so my plan was to go see them. I had never been, there's only a few states I've never been to. One is California. One is Arizona, one is Nevada. So I thought, well, I could see three states, I could see my daughter, I could drive down, see my sister. And then there was a pandemic. So I never did any of those things. <laughs> uh, there's more to come though, more to come. You are in a great spot. Um, so Polly also wanted to know, what are the trails like? I think you mentioned a little bit that, uh, you know, it was deer trails, but can you talk a little bit more about the trail conditions? Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, they're not really manicured, the, not most of them. Um, I've only been on the trails in this particular patch, but uh, Grandeur Peak is the local peak. I showed an image of, of uh, Mount Olympus, and that is south of us here. I would say that Grandeur Peak is the next kind of peak up. Mount Olympus, I think, is a little taller, and they have trails up to the summit of that as well, but the, the sort of the main trails up to these peaks are sort of manicured. Uh, there's one that goes north, I'm sorry, yeah, north of us here, it goes around and up to this peak, the summit of Grandeur Peak. And then there's one actually south, which is called the Pipeline Trail, which you could take. It's, again, it's kind of manicured, and it goes up through the woods up to the summit of Grandeur Peak. When Jack and I went to the summit of Grandeur Peak, we just were taking our main, you know, the trail. We go straight up. We got up there and thought, well, let's go a little farther. I mean, you know, Jack wasn't in on the discussion, but <laughs> he agreed. And... Um, and I ended up thinking, wait a minute, this is, I think we're close to Grandeur Peak here. So we just kept going and then it was, it was kind of, it was in April and it, and it was a uh, little snow still up there. And I uh, thought we'd turn back. And we did this, this is where those mountain bluebirds were. We did this three times, four times, something like that. Got up to 7,500 feet and I saw where you could go. There's kind of a knife edge kind of thing that you, that you take across it's you know it's wide enough to get by but rocky and and then and uh, so finally we we did it we did the knife edge we walked up this last 100 200 feet or so and emerged onto the summit of grandeur peak wow. and there was somebody else walking up through this manicured trail and this other guy behind manicured trail and uh we came down the same way we went up uh and come to find out later that was called the dragon's tail route <laughs> Very appropriately named based on your description. It's popular when people, for people to go up it, but usually they'll park their car down in the parking lot with one of those manicured trails and they'll go down the manicured trail because it's, I've learned it's harder to go down than go up. 
So I think you just answered one of Becky's questions. She wants to know if you frequently see other people on your day hikes. That's um, really interesting because what with the pandemic and so forth, basically I mean, the friends I've made here are, have been hiking, you know, trail friends. Um, they're hikers, you know, outdoor people. And most of them, I would say most of them have dogs with them. So Jack and I have met a lot of other people and dogs up on these trails. There's dog walking operations that go up to these trails and you know big groups of dogs. Beach Hill, of course, is you, you want to have your dog leashed. I, I can't count. If I had a dollar for every time, I'd remind somebody to <laughs> leash their dog there. But here up in the trails, you don't have to. And um, yeah, Jack's befriended a whole bunch of dogs. And, but they're not that, I mean, it's not, there have been there are many days actually when I see nobody because we come up, like to come up kind of early mm. uh, on weekdays and everything. So during the week, especially, but on the weekends, this place is, uh, I would say the, the people here are really friendly, friendliest I've met anywhere in the Salt Lake City area. And they're very outdoorsy folks, a lot of skiers and a lot of, there's, uh, there's a, another sort of pastime, which is paragliding. We've, we pass a lot of, you know, young fit, people with gigantic packs on their backs, hiking up to these ridges, you know, a couple thousand feet. And then they paraglide down wow. to the little playground of an elementary school down here. <laughs> uh, amazing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I guess it's a big, long, hard slog. And the reward at the end is about, I don't know, five minutes of, or less of <laughs> mm. sailing down. But. Um, so Amy wanted to know, uh, Amy Fisher, she's from Camden, she wanted to know um, any animals of prey that would stop you from hiking alone or with, or with Jack. Uh, so do you see anything or, or know of any, um, do you have problems with bears or wolves or anything like that? Um, I don't know about wolves. I think they're farther north. Um, bears are probably up in the mountains. Um, I've debated carrying bear spray. Uh, we don't tend to get really high where, you know, most of the wildlife, um, you know, the, the, the ones that like to keep away from civilization lurk and roam. Uh, but uh, I would say if I were hiking alone way up in the mountains, I would probably at least have bear spray. Mm. Um, you know, mountain lions is something that bothered me a lot at first. Um, you know, there haven't really been any attacks. And another thing is there are just plenty of mule deer, plenty of mule deer for them to eat. So, so you probably just look scrawny in comparison yeah, exactly. to some delicious, juicy mule, yeah, mule deer. But I've um, learned to do if you run into a mountain lion, and you, know, you never run, don't run, or you're doomed. You walk backwards, looking at them, keep eye contact, and look big, and even scream and holler. I met some people that uh, they were out in their yard, and it was opened up into a wild area, and the older folks, like me, and they suddenly a mule deer came dashing down toward them and it veered away. And behind it was a mountain lion dashing down toward them. Oh, and wow. They, they both just screamed, you know, yelled really loud, and the mountain lion pulled up and ran away. So I guess just scream really loud and maybe they'll leave. That is action packed. I, I <laughs> screamed at a, um, at a groundhog today, but <laughs> I don't get to see mountain lions running through my backyard, that's for sure. Okay, let's see. We have uh, Becky who says she, she really appreciates the real life experiences that you've spoken of, and she's inspired to go out and walk Beach Hill locally. So that's nice. And also um, for visitors to Camden area, what would you recommend? Where else would you recommend hiking besides Beach Hill? Oh, yikes. Uh, I like the carriage trail, um, Mount Nagunicook area. That, that was always a fun hike. Um, the other Girls to Mountains land trust trails are great. Bald Mountain, I believe. Um, I just, I mean, I've done quite a few of the others, but I, it's hard to remember them because I do them a couple times and I do Beach Hill 365 times a year. So what people could probably do is visit the Coastal Mountains Land Trust website Absolutely. and they can, they can find out digital images of all and, and descriptions of all the trails. And actually, I'm also gonna plug, they have a little book, a guidebook to their trails and it is awesome. It's really, really helpful. Looking um, forward to the Around the Mountain Trail. Yes, yes, we, we, are, we started a little bit of it last season and we're excited to get out on it this year. Um, so we have a lot of thank yous coming in. Um, 
people say and what an excellent program this was and they really appreciated the detailed tour of the west and i must agree this was a pleasure Thank you so much for taking some time out in the middle of your day because you're a couple hours before us or earlier. Um, we appreciate that. I see Polly clapping. Uh, <laughs> and thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. It was a beautiful evening and a lot of fun to do this uh, armchair adventure to Utah together. Uh, I hope you will join us for more programs. You can find out about everything that the library has going on by visiting librarycamden.org. And um, again, we do these programs with the Coastal Mountain Land Trust on second Thursdays. So we hope you'll come back. And uh, again, if you enjoyed it, I'm posting this on YouTube afterwards. So if you need a link to that, let me know. One more time, Brian. Awesome presentation. Thank you Thank so you. much. It was fun. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank Have you. a good night. Bye-bye.